There was a man many years ago named Viktor Frankl, and uh, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a psychologist and psychiatrist uh, who, um, as a Jewish man, was taken prisoner by the Nazis during World War II and was imprisoned in a, in a Nazi death camp. As a matter of fact, he was shuffled between four different Nazi death camps, including Auschwitz, uh, back uh, during the Second World War. During that time, he suffered incredible, incredible pain and loss. Um, what happened to him was, uh, first of all, his mother and father were imprisoned with him, and he watched his mother and father die. His wife was pregnant when they were taken prisoners by the Nazis, and he watched his wife and thus his child die. And throughout the course of his time there, moved around from one camp to another, he saw many, many people, uh, fellow Jews, who died uh, during that time in the camp. But as a psychiatrist and a psychologist, he was most interested in as, of observing the behavior of the people and who was able to um, withstand or even survive these most deplorable conditions and, and who was not. And what he found was very, very interesting because what Frankel discovered was it had nothing to do really with the conditions that the people were in. It had nothing to do with how healthy they were or not. It really had nothing to do with how strong they were physically. He saw very strong men who died and very frail people who survived. As a matter of fact, um, what he found out was that those who survived uh, in, these, in these, again, deplorable contr contritions, in, in, the, in the conditions that were, were torturous and, and the malnutrition, you know, the beatings and, and, and all of this, the ones who survived were simply this. They had a will to live. They had a will to live. They never, they never just gave up on life. Uh, they, they had to live because, you see, in their will to live, the people who survived had somebody in their mind that they wanted to see again. Uh, they, they had to live because they wanted to see these people, or, or there were things in their life they really felt like they still needed to accomplish. In other words, uh, the survivors of the, deathy, de the, of the uh, deadly uh, death camps were people who had some meaning to live for. And what we call that, folks, is purpose. We, we call that having a purpose in life. And, and, and it's having a purpose in life that drives us throughout life. Indeed, it's the very source of life that we have a purpose to live for. Now, Every one of us here who uh, call ourselves Christians, we're, we're followers of Jesus Christ, we have a very, very, very important purpose to live for. And that purpose that we have to live for is to tell other people about Jesus. You see, Jesus himself, after he was crucified, after he was raised from the dead, he met with his disciples. And with his disciples... Uh, we have recorded his words in what's called uh, the book of Matthew. It's the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament of the Bible. The Bible's divided into Old Testament and New Testament. The very first book in the New Testament is written by Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples. And in the last chapter, the last words Jesus spoke to them was, Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. In other words, he was telling his followers, I know you believe in me. And therefore, your everlasting life is secured. Because that's what it means to, to believe in Jesus, to, to have everlasting life. To know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven is simply to receive the free gift of salvation that comes through Jesus. To believe that He's God's Son who died on the cross to save us from our sins, but that He rose again. That, 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 that's, that secures our salvation but our purpose for being here on earth. So why are we still here as followers of Christ? And that is to fulfill that passage, those words he gave his disciples, to make more disciples. 
And that's, that's what our purpose is. That should be the driving purpose of every person who calls himself a follower of Christ. This is the task that we have been given. Here at Woodlands, we exist as a church so that we can share this good news with more and more people. We want to share this good news with our community. We don't want to keep it locked up in here on Sunday morning. No, we want to take it out to our community every day, every week, all year long, year after year. We want people to know that Jesus loves them. We want people to know that He has a purpose for them in life. And folks, there are so many who are living a purposeless life. There are so many who, who don't even know if they want to go on. There are so many who, who just feel like, you know, why, why even try? Because people have been beaten down over and over again. We sang that song, You Never Fail Us. But you know what, folks? There's a lot of people who don't believe that. There's a lot of, and some of you here may have been singing those words saying, you know what, I'm not sure I believe that. Because I feel like I've been failed in my life over and over again. And that is the task that we have as followers of Christ, is to tell people about Jesus. The one who really hasn't failed them. He's still with them. He's still with you. He's still working. It's not over yet. Don't give up. Hang in there. Stay with it. And that's what our passage today is really all about. Because you see, our highest call is to share this good news of Jesus with other people. Now, in the book of uh, Philemon, it's just a one-chapter uh, letter, actually, in the New Testament. I love this verse. It says, I pray that you, you, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He's the guy who wrote this letter, a brilliant Christian man who wrote 13 letters that are now included as books in the New Testament of the Bible. The Apostle Paul, he said, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Why? So that, so that always answers the why question, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You see, it's in sharing our faith with other people that we who call ourselves followers of Christ experience the very, very best of what Christianity is all about. Now, most Christians find it difficult to talk about God with their co-workers or, or their neighbors or, or their relatives, you know, those who aren't Christians. And so what I want to do right now is I'm going to uh, have us take a quick look, short video, um, a, a guy named Gabe Lyons is being interviewed here. He's a pastor and an author, um, and he's really been kind of a, a world changer uh, in, in, in the Christian world um, because he's done a great, great job as a guy who truly believes in Jesus and truly believes in the Bible as the Word of God, but in helping us understand that we live in a post-Christian world. All right, and for those of you who are, you know, maybe my age, you know, uh, even and younger, even we grew up in a world where, you know, you could go to church and people didn't think you were weird because you went to church, right? You would talk about Christianity and people didn't think that was necessarily a bad thing. Folks, we live in a world today, and for you younger folks, I don't have to tell you this; you all know this. But for those who may not know it, we live in a world today that that Christians are no longer seen as the good guys, okay? And there are reasons for that. As a matter of fact, Gabe Lyons, who we're going to see in this video, he wrote a book um, along with a man named Dave Kenneman um, that really uh, called Unchristian, Unchristian. And in that book, he, he, he outlines, they did tons of research, and they outlined the things that Christian people have done that have actually contributed to what we now see as a post-Christian America. So let's take a look at Gabe and see what he has to say to us about sharing our faith. People aren't concerned about where they're going to go if they die tonight. That's not a question on people's minds. Um, I think people are more interested in knowing, what am I supposed to do if I live tomorrow? 
in New York City, I see it a lot. We, we, you have people very passionate about what they believe in the subway and the, the different train stations, whether it's paraphernalia or handing out things or just trying to talk to people who are in a rush and hurrying by or even preaching in the middle of a subway, you know, full of strangers and really busy people uh, with their headphones on and face down in books and, and yet somebody passionate, bold, who really believes the story of Jesus, you know, just starts kind of yelling it and saying it and hoping people are listening and yet people's eyes are rolling and they're looking every other direction and they're trying to just focus on what they want to be focused on at that moment. and don't really pay attention uh, because in some ways we're trying to answer a question we think they have and yet they're not even asking the question anymore. What is my life supposed to look like? What am I supposed to do with my talents and my gifts? And how am I supposed to be a part of this big, huge world with seven billion people? Do I have any role to play in that? That's the question people are asking. And so when we do these random things to try to communicate with passion what we believe, but nobody's really listening, we can do a great disservice, I think, to the advancement of, of this good news story. I think being in a relationship with people gives you opportunities to share your story, to talk about what you believe and why, in a, in a context of mutual respect and humility, not coming to the table thinking, I've got every answer and, and I need to teach you something, but saying, I can learn from you too. I, I don't have all the answers. There's some things I'm learning and figuring out and I would love to explore that, but I don't, um, I don't come into this conversation in a one-sided way trying to convert you or win you to my way of thinking. Instead, I'm gonna trust that it's the love of Jesus pursuing you that's gonna win you um, at the right time and that I'm not in control of that. What I'm in control of is that I actually care for you in this moment, that I'm actually listening, that I actually am responding in a way that um, I believe God wants me to respond to another human being in crisis or in need of a listening ear or advice or counsel or just somebody there to comfort in the midst of pain. So the, what Gabe Lyons is saying to us is that the reason we struggle talking with people who are far from God about God is simply because we don't have a real relationship with them. And, and that is our goal as Christ followers is we want to have a real relationship with people. And what that means is we need to set our agenda aside. Yes, ultimately we want to tell them about Jesus. But folks, that's not where we begin. That's what we're leading to. We want to, first of all, experience and, and get to know people, know their hearts, know what makes them tick, know what, what they struggle with, what, you know, what, what is their heartache, how do they feel about purpose, do they, do, do they feel like they have a purpose in life? Um, so those are the kind of things that we need to do. And the best way to make friends, folks, is quite simply how? To be a friend, right? I mean, we teach kids this. You want to make a friend? Well, be a friend. And that's really what we're talking about here today. Colossians chapter 4, verses uh, 2 through 6, is uh, our main uh, focus for today. So I invite you to turn to that if you have a Bible with you, a smartphone or tablet. Uh, we'll also have it right up here on the screen. Colossians 4, let me just read it here uh, in all together, and then we'll look at it verse by verse. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. Now, this is why I am here in chains. Now, I might catch you off guard. The Apostle Paul, same guy I mentioned earlier, he wrote this letter to the church in Colossae. It's why it's called Colossians. And he was actually in chains. He was in prison for one reason, because he was telling people about Jesus. He was telling them that Christ was the Messiah, the Savior, and the only way to salvation. Pray for me, that, uh, the, that is why I am here in chains. Verse 4, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. 
uh, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So three, three practices here that we're going to take a look at in these passages. All right, uh, the first one, first practice we see is in verse 2. And that is uh, that the first practice that enables us to build better relationships with people who are far from God is prayer. So prayer is where we need to begin. Prayer is where we always need to begin. Um, prayer is the, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And prayer is just simply conversation with God. In Colossians 4.2, it says, devote yourselves. And if you've got your Bible there, if you want to you know, highlight the word devote, okay, devote yourselves to prayer. Now, see, intercessory prayer, we call it intercessory prayer, by definition is primarily asking. Intercessory prayer means to intercede. It means to intervene. It means to negotiate. It means to arbitrate. So when you intercede for somebody, you, you are literally praying for them to God, and you are interceding for them, uh, uh, arbitrating for them, making a plea for them. All right, so um, this word devote, it's pretty interesting. The word, uh, the word devote, um, and again, uh, the, the English translations of Scripture we have are translated, uh, the New Testament, from Greek. Uh, the original Greek is what the, the Bible was first written in. We translate it to English. Now, here's the thing. This word devote, it's translated from a word that when we look at that, we, we get a little deeper. What does it mean to devote yourself to prayer? Well, one person translated it this way, to persist obstinately, to persist obstinately in prayer. As a matter of fact, one person said to, uh, to persist obnoxiously, all right? I mean, to pray and pray and pray in such a way that your praying becomes almost obnoxious. You know, I mean, if, are you that person who's always saying, well, let's pray about that? I had a friend who did that. Um, he's uh, into his 80s now. Uh, I've known him for uh, 30 years. And I know every time I would call him to ask him about something, or every time I would talk to him and say something and, and kind of get his advice on something because he's just, you know, he's a great guy, knows a lot of stuff, he would say, well, I don't know if I have an answer for you, Daniel, but I know I can pray, so, you know, let's just let's pray about it. And sometimes I'd be like, you know, his name is Paul. Paul, how about some advice? All right. <laughs> I've been praying, okay? But he, I mean, he was so devoted to prayer that the first thing he did was pray. And we need to be that way toward the people that we love who are far from God. We need to obnoxiously, obstinately be praying for them. Um, now, this is very, very important, folks, because we tend to lose heart especially those of us who are Americans, we're born here in this great country, and we have so much at our fingertips. We also have so much that we can do in our own power, out of our own resources, all right? I mean, many of us, believe it or not, are considered rich, you know, as far as the world's wealth standard is concerned, Okay, I can tell you more about that if you want to, uh, you know, debate me on that a little bit. I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. Um, but we're, we're rich. We can pretty much buy the things we need to get. We can take care of the things we need to have. Folks, here's the thing. And one of the great things about sharing our faith is we can't make that happen. We can't save anybody. Only God can save. Okay, so we, we need to pray. And we need to pray passionately, obstinately. I, I knew a lady when I used to go to church camp. Her name was Ruby Taylor. And Ruby um, had a son who had walked away from God. And he had, he had, you know, was living a life far, far from God. Which was really strange because Ruby and her husband Bob, the camp directors, were two of the most godly people I ever knew in my entire life. And yet their son had walked away. And she shared the story that she prayed for her son for 25 years. 25 years she prayed for him daily, devoted to prayer, obstinately praying. And after 25 years of prayer, he finally gave his life to Jesus. Folks, we have to be persistent in praying. We can't give up so quickly. Now, the next key word we see in this, you know, devote yourself to prayer and be alert. And in other words, you want to circle or highlight, be alert. Now, this word, it, it literally means to be alert. It means to be vigilant 
or to be watchful. Or here's one, stay awake. (laughs) That word alert literally means stay awake. That's a good word for some of you on Sunday morning, right? (laughs) That pastor's preaching up there, stay awake. All right? Because, because, I mean, Paul may very well have been thinking about how Jesus' closest friends, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, when they were in the Garden of Eden the night before Jesus was betrayed, the Bible tells us that Peter, James, and John kept falling asleep when he asked them to pray with him. And he was like, guys, can't you just pray with me for one hour? You know, there was another time he was with them uh, when they were up on a mountain, this thing uh, called the Transfiguration. You can read about it in the Gospels. But it was another time he was away with those same three. And the Bible tells us that they fell asleep. I mean, the disciples, they, they kept falling asleep, right? And, and, and we see, and hey, let's not be critical, right? I mean, I've fallen asleep while praying, okay? And by the way... Probably better to fall asleep while praying than falling asleep doing a lot of other things, okay? If I can just let you know that. But here's the thing. We're told to be alert. Be awake when we pray. In other words, be urgent about it. This is urgent. We have to do this. So be urgent in that. Um, This uh, this word also has this idea of give give strict attention to it. I I remember when I was um, uh, in seminary and graduate school, I was driving from Lombard, okay, western suburb, out to Marengo, you know, which is well west of Elgin, uh, about halfway between Elgin and Rockford, and I would take that drive twice a week, and the Wednesday night was the toughest one, because it took about an hour and 15 minutes to get there uh, from Lombard, where I was in school, and so coming back home, a lot of nights I would get really, really tired, and I needed to stay alert, I needed to stay awake, and one night, I was driving, and I tell you what, I just don't even remember like several miles that went by. Then all of a sudden, woo, 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 these lights went on behind me, and I was like, oh boy, you know, and I, I mean, I'm like trying to snap out of it. I was so tired. I'm like, was I speeding? You know, whatever was I doing, whatever. So I pull over, and the officer comes up, you know, and I do the routine, hands up here, you know. Make sure. And, and uh, I said, yes, officer. And uh, he said, um, you been drinking tonight, son? <laughs> I said, uh, actually, no, I haven't been. And, uh, and, and he goes, well, you were weaving all over the road. I said, oh, no, sir, I was just really, really tired. He said, well, why don't you step out of the car for me? Okay, officer. And so he starts by, why don't you just reach out and touch your nose? I was like, okay. And I'm still kind of tired at this point, like this. And I touched my nose, and then he said, why don't you walk this line right here on the edge of the road? You know how roads are crowned? They do that so that the water runs off of it. Well, I'm sitting over here, and I'm kind of on the edge a little bit, and I took one step, two step, and went whoop. At that point, I was wide awake. I said, hold it, officer. Wait a minute. I'll do it again. Nose, nose, Walk, walk, walk. I promise you, I've not been drinking. (laughs) And I tried to let him, you know, I'm a youth pastor and I never drink and I don't even like alcohol. Um, Anyway, at that point, I was wide awake, okay? Guys, we have to be wide awake when we pray. We have to do it with urgency. And we have to do it as if, as if, oh, wait a minute. Someone's life depended on it because it does finally he says pray with a thankful heart in verse chapter in verse 2 now this is an interesting word in greek it's 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 um uh, eucharistia eucharistia and the root word of that is eucharist now some of you may know that word eucharist what what what's another word for eucharist in our in our church language Anybody know? Communion. communion. That's right. The Eucharist is also, it's synonymous with communion. So we share communion here at Woodlands once a month on the first Sunday of the month. And that's where we remember the Lord's death and resurrection. We take from the cup. We 
we, 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 we take the, 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 the bread, which reminds us of his body, and the, and the cup of juice that reminds us of his blood that was spilled for us. So when we take communion, what we're literally doing, it literally means to be thankful, to have a thankful heart. So when we take it, what we're doing is we're saying, thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross to save me from my sins. You know, that's literally what the Eucharist or communion is all about. And so he's saying that we should pray with a thankful heart. We should always, you know, begin praying with an attitude of gratitude, okay? Because see, here's the thing. Gratitude is the safeguard against grumbling and complaining, Gratitude is the safeguard against grumbling and complaining. And I can tell you, folks, in our world today, it is just so easy to default to grumbling and complaining. In the church, all it takes is a few people who start grumbling and complaining, and pretty soon they can make life miserable for a lot of people. It's very, very destructive. And the antidote to grumbling and complaining is a thankful heart to focus on the things that we can be thankful for. Uh, Guy King, a writer, a theologian, he summarizes nicely. He says, um, his love, God's love, wants the best for us. God's love, God's wisdom knows the best for us, and his power gets the best for us. I, I use this little... Uh, prayer guide. We make them available. We have some back here at the Welcome Center that you can grab if you want to during 21 days of prayer, which by the way kicks off August 5th, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, right here on a Sunday morning. We do 21 days of prayer twice a year. We start that August 5th. We're passing out prayer guides then as well. I make them available for anybody whenever you want them. We just give them out for free. Uh, but in this prayer guide, I've been using it now for a couple of years, and this prayer guide, it has a prayer in it called the Tabernacle Prayer. And, and there's seven stations in the Tabernacle Prayer, and the very first station is Begin with Thanksgiving. And so every time I have my daily quiet time, my daily prayer and Bible reading time, every time I begin it with thanksgiving. I begin simply by thanking God. As a matter of fact, every station has a scripture that goes with it. The scripture that goes with this first station is Psalm 100 verse 4, which says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So every single day, I try to begin my own personal prayer time by thanking God, especially for my salvation. Because the fact is, folks, I mean, the greatest thing God did for us was to open up the way for us to be saved through Jesus Christ. And no matter what else is going on in life, Okay, no matter how difficult everything else is, if we can remember that, that we can be thankful for what God has done for us. And here's what it does, my friends. It puts everything else in perspective. Because when you remember how much God has forgiven you and forgiven me for all of our sin, right? Because we talk about this here at Woodlands. The fact is every single one of us Every single one of us are sinners, okay? And, 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 and the, we, we say that, you know, because of our thought life, because of the things that we do, we're all sinners. And if God can forgive us for our sins, then there is nothing that we cannot forgive of the people in our lives. So important. So important you get this. Because, folks, this is how, we, this is how we, we truly live to be godly people. You see, Christian people just shouldn't ever give up. We should never give up on each other. And sometimes that's hard, I know. Okay? And I know some of you have been through some real horrors in your life. Through abuse and, and, and this kind of thing. But if we never give up and we keep praying and we ask God, we thank Him and we start thinking about all the things in our lives that we've been forgiven for, suddenly we realize whatever that person did to us, you know what? 
If God can forgive me for me, then He can give me the strength to forgive you for you. So we, that thankfulness really sets the tone for our prayer life. Um, Paul is thankful for so many reasons. Um, in, uh, back to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, we'll continue through this. Pray for, us to, pray for us too, Paul says, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. So he's saying, we need, Paul is saying, pray for us that we'll have more opportunities to tell people about Christ. Now, folks, what's wrong with this picture? He is in jail. And I'm telling you, it's nasty. Okay? The Roman jails were nothing like the federal prisons that we have here in America. All right? I mean, where people get three square meals a day, you know, and you get to watch cable television, you know, and there's all different kind of things to do, club fed, as it's, they sometimes call it. Not saying that prison or federal penitentiaries are, are, are a great place to be. They're not, obviously. But you know what? Paul was in a hole, a dirty hole. We're talking rats. We're talking filth. We're talking no toilets. <laughs> I get grossed out when I go to a public bathroom and I see somebody using it and, and they don't wash their hands. Hello. Amen. Come on now. Now, if you're sitting there going, What's wrong with that? We, we need to talk. You and me, all right? All right, you and me. Um, Paul's focus, check this out. He, his focus is not on his circumstances. Folks, this is a game changer for many of us here today, those watching online. He did not pray about his circumstances. He was not complaining, asking everybody to pray for him that, oh, get us out of this place. Get us out of this miserable place. We just can't stand being here anymore. That's not what he did. But think about it. How often do our prayers center around our circumstances? I'm here to say that I bet the most of our prayers are centered around our circumstances. You know, Lord, if I just had, <clears throat> if I just had a better house, you know, Lord, if I just, if I just had a better car, all right, Lord, Lord, Lord if I just had a better husband, <laughs> life would be so much better. Lord, if I, if I just had more money, Lord, Lord, if I, if I just, if I just had a better job. Lord, if we just had a better pastor, just, you know, help me, Jesus, that boy needs help. Paul didn't focus his prayers on his circumstances. Instead, he focused on a higher purpose, which is why he was able to be thankful. His primary concern was that people get saved. His primary concern wasn't about him at all. He wasn't, I mean, guys, I'm not saying that he didn't feel it. Obviously, he didn't like being in prison. When they gave him an opportunity to get out, okay, at one point, he didn't say, oh, no, thanks, I think I'll stay. You know, no, he, he got out as fast as he could, you know. It's not like it was enjoyable where he was. It's not like he didn't miss his favorite foods, okay. It's not like he didn't miss the close fellowship of, of the other followers of Christ, it was a difficult situation. It was painful, and he was hurting. But that's not where his focus was. Just like the Viktor Frankl story that we began with today, it is what you choose to focus on that makes all the difference. What's your purpose? Next time you're complaining about a relationship, next time you're complaining about your work, next time you're complaining about some circumstance in life, stop yourself and think, God, why am I here? What is my purpose? Is my purpose to make more money? Is my purpose to be more, more at ease? Is my purpose to be more comfortable? 
Paul says no. He asked, that, that he asked them to pray for his witness right where he was in prison. Paul asked them to pray, verse 4, that I may make it clear that is the gospel, which is how I ought to speak. He's saying, he's saying, hey, pray for me, not only that I share the gospel, that I make it really clear to the people that I'm talking with. Do you real? I mean, folks, we got to pray that prayer specifically for every person that we share the gospel with because one size does not fit all, okay? I mean, we serve a God who is creative in every way. He gave us all unique thumbprints. He gave us all unique retinal scans, Okay, he made us unique in every way. Even twins have slight variational differences in their DNA. Every person, we need to approach them as an individual. This is not cookie-cutter Christianity. We welcome the fact that people are different. All right? We embrace the diversity on all levels. And so we need to pray specifically, Lord, help me to be clear. Help me to be clear, specifically to this person. Paul was very conscious of how he shared the gospel. We should pray for each other that we will be able to share the gospel clearly, boldly, graciously. Always remember grace and truth, grace and truth, grace and truth. John 1.14 says, and Jesus came bringing grace and truth. In everything we share, we need to bring grace, we need to bring truth. Do you ever ask close Christian friends to pray for you that way? When's the last time you asked someone, hey man, would you pray for me? You know, hey sister, would you pray for me that I would share the gospel clearly? We need to make that clear. Instead of asking God to give you a better job, pray that he will powerfully use you where you are, right? Instead of asking him to move you out of your neighborhood, ask God to use you powerfully in that neighborhood, all right? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for improved circumstances, all right? We all are in situations at times where we want things to get better. You may want your kids to be in a better school system. Nothing wrong with praying for that, okay? That's all right. I'm just saying, as long as he's got you there, he's got you there for a purpose. And don't miss the opportunity by looking beyond at something else. We've got to stay focused with where we are and keep that higher purpose in mind of sharing the good news of Jesus. Number two, the second practice to build better relationships with people far from God is our actions and behavior. Colossians 4, 5 says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Now when it says make the most of every opportunity, it means work urgently. All right, we gotta, we gotta get after this. Now that phrase, opportunity, every opportunity, that's actually a phrase that comes out of the marketplace. It's a marketplace term, and it means to, to buy out. In other words, get as much as you can as quickly as you can, all right? Some of you who understand finances, you get the idea of a, of a seller's market and a buyer's market, right? I mean, after the economic downturn of 2007, 2008, I mean, there were, there were people who were selling, 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 getting out as fast as they could. There were other people kind of sitting back watching, and as soon as the market hit the bottom, what'd they do? Buy, 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 buy. And there are people today who are billionaires because of what they did during that market downturn. There are also people who today are flat broke who were once millionaires, okay? Folks, we got to make the most of every opportunity. We, we can't pass up any opportunity we have to talk and to share about Christ. Um, opportunity, um, in other words, it's, we got to make the most of the time, and I don't mean a duration of time, I mean the, this time, okay? So in, in the early days of the, uh, the days of the early church, here's the thing. When I say that, uh, let me hang on just a second. I just got one step ahead of myself. We got to make the most of this time because we may not have another chance, is what I'm saying. Okay? We, we, we can't pass up an opportunity uh, to share with someone about the love of God. And, and by the way, one thing you can do is just an act of kindness for them. You can invite them to Woodlands, you know, just invite them to your church. Those, these are very unthreatening things to do. I, I, there's not very many people on this earth, you know, who are going to hate you because you invited them to come to church with you. Okay? And may not come. 
But, but, and, by, and by the way, on the way out today, we have some cards we want to give you to help you do some loving acts of kindness and to let people know. I know one guy in our church, uh, uh, I was told that he likes to go through Starbucks and buy the coffee for the person behind him. He gets up to pay his bill, and he goes, hey, um, how much is the one behind me? Oh, that's this much. Okay, I'm going to pay for that one too. And, and he actually got one of these cards and gave it to the lady or the person in the window at Starbucks and said, give them this card when they come by and just, just tell them to have a great day. You know, isn't that cool? Guys, those are the kind of acts of kindness that, that will change the culture when people start understanding that those people at Woodlands, man, they're nice folks. I mean, you know, they, they don't even, they know, they're not telling me I have to be like them. They're saying, I accept you the way you are. And that is the key to church, folks. Because too many churches across this nation expect people to be like them. And if that's the way we're going to be, we're never going to be successful in sharing the gospel. But that is not who we are. We are a church that appreciates the diversity of all the different things that God has given us here. So... Um, Make the most of every opportunity. Work urgently. Um, I'm going to just kind of skip ahead here. i gotta got to move on. Uh, let me just go on to, um, well, be, be, a, uh, be a model friend. We, we see a great passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 to 23. In, P, in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23, I don't have this on the screen for you, so you have to write this down and, and look it up. Um, it says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So folks, we are Christians. Anybody who calls himself a Christian, and I realize everybody here wouldn't identify with that term, but, but for those who call themselves Christians, we've committed ourselves to walk in the steps of Jesus, to be like him, to look like him. And it says that he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So, folks, we do have to commit ourselves to living a holy and pure life. What does that look like? The Bible describes it. Just got to read your Bible, and you'll know what that means. Uh, 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate, but he did put a post on Facebook telling them they were all haters and that they should die and that they should pretty much, you know, like cease to exist. especially because we were of different political parties. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Do you believe in God? Do you have faith in God? If you have faith in God, then when someone puts you down, you don't have to retaliate. You don't have to get back in their face and one-up them. You can trust that God's going to take care of it. So, you put something on your social media that you think it's benign, you don't really think much of it, somebody comes back and tears you to shreds. You know what? You don't have to start debating them. You can simply say, Thank you for your input. We'll have to agree to disagree. Truth and grace, right? You're not a doormat. You don't roll over. Be a model friend. And what characterizes a friend? You guys know this, right? Thoughtfulness, kindness, service. How can you serve? I know some people here at Woodlands, they love it when it snows because they get to go out and, and snow blow a bunch of driveways for their neighbors, okay? That's just an act of service, okay? Generosity, being generous, time, giving your time for people, okay? A model friend is someone who is a blessing. Remember that, we're going to come back to that. Uh, finally, number three, this is the last one, we'll wrap this up. The third practice that enables us to build better relationships with people who are far from God, is our speech. So what do we have? We have prayer, devoted prayer, obnoxious prayer, if you will, because we just keep praying. We have our actions and attitudes, okay? The way that we act, uh, kind of the old way of saying it is that our, you know, it's more about our walk than our talk, all right? But the third one, then, is about our speech, the things that we say. Colossians 4, 6, Paul says, let our conversation be gracious, and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. 
Another translation says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. So don't be rude or harsh. Don't be in your face. But be kind, generous, and forgiving. Spiritual, uh, gracious speech was actually a term that non-Christians used to describe sparkling conversation, speech dotted with witty, clever remarks. Folks, there are way too many Christians that are just way too stodgy, all right? Way too stodgy, okay? Way too stoic. When we engage people in a Christian conversation, we should be alert, ready to, you know, throw in a little wit, a little humor. Don't take it so seriously. God's got this. And if you trust that God's got this, that frees you up to just be you. Well, I want you to remember this today. So how you remember, I just want you to remember the word bless, okay? To bless. And it's an acrostic. It goes like this. Begin with prayer. Two, listen to their story with empathy. So begin with prayer, then listen. E is eat. Eat with people outside your faith community. Folks, we all ought to be looking for people that we can invite over for a barbecue or invite out for a dinner out together. S, serve. Look for ways to be a servant to others today. And then finally, S, share the story of your faith journey. We talked about that a lot last week, which you can go back and watch that online if you'd like to. Finally, I'd like to encourage you, those video, uh, that video we watched earlier came from a website called exploregod.com. And this is a website that's amazing. And it's got tons of, 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 of uh, videos on there you can watch. It's got tons of, of things that are written to help you understand some of the hard issues of faith. I encourage you to visit that website, exploregod.com. We're actually going to do a, a, a six-week series in January of 2019, January, February, uh, uh, called Explore God. And in that series... There are hundreds and hundreds of churches in Chicago area that are going to do that same series that same weekend. Keep your eyes open. There's billboards going up around uh, the Chicagoland area that say explorgod.com. And it's a great way for you to learn more about your faith as well as eventually to point people to if they're people that you have a relationship with. Um, what we're going to do now, let's uh, bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that um, you... you you desire, Father, for people who are far from you to be saved. God, there's nobody so far away that they can't be saved. Uh, Lord, there's, there's, there's nothing that's crossed a line that you can't save them. So, God, we pray for salvation. We pray for salvation for our friends, our families, our neighbors, our relatives who are far from you. Lord, Empower us to stay awake and to pray obstinately, obnoxiously for their salvation. Lord, guard our steps that we can live the kind of life, not a perfect life, God, but a life of integrity. That when we do mess up, God, we don't try to cover it up, but rather we confess our sin, even to one another. And finally, God, let our speech, let our speech be the kind of speech that encourages other people. Like Ephesians says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth, only that which is useful for building others up according to their need. In Jesus' name, amen.